Hello, hello again. Day 11. Can you believe it? One, one. 11 days in our 365-day challenge to racial change. I am your host. I like the sound of that. <laughs> Tomlin's nigh back. And uh, we're going to explore uh, issues of race, specifically uh, black American life in America, how it came to be, is it okay, are blacks um, still being oppressed in some ways, or have, has all that slavery stuff been put behind us? We're going to look at that over the next year uh, through various uh, media, mostly books, <clears throat> Um, especially um, information from a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. My life has been uh, just changed irrevocably since I watched this man on YouTube. Um, I'm actually late to this conversation about race and his real and sober, lucid look at history and its impact, how these... I, uh, attitudes and ideas still pervade uh, American society, especially today, and the world. We want to get into that. I just stumbled onto some more stuff uh, as I reread some of his material. Some of the books of his that we are informed by is a Black History Reader. Please get these books. You can go to uh, Powernomics.com or uh, the Heritage Institute, probably .com. Anyway, just Google these books. Please get them at ASAP um, in the next year. If this thing gets going well enough, um, I might be, uh, I'm the kind of person that splurges for that kind of thing, but not right now. You get it. You get these books. Okay. Also, he has uh, Black Labor and White Wealth, and uh, White Wealth rests on the backs of Black Labor. Uh, as Dr. Anderson clearly points out, and we can show historical proof after proof to verify uh, those, that truth. And his plan, National Plan to Empower Black America, a sketch blueprint to have uh, blacks work together to get our own community going. Community is more important than the neighborhood. The neighborhood is just where you eat and sleep, but the community is where economics occurs. It's where uh, something he goes into ethno aggregation and vertical integration. Very important aspects of a successful community. Just look how white folks operate. Look how Asians operate. Look how Hispanics operate. Blacks in general don't operate like that are a very small minority pockets of blacks working work like that. Um, the more of us that come together and do that, um, the better chances of success uh, of us taking, being taken seriously and making some changes, breaking ceilings and barriers in America and then further into the world. <clears throat> And also, we're going to have fun. We're going to have fun periodically. Some some day some days will be technical and um, historical and facts and things like that. I'll rant once in a while, and also we'll we'll um, go and have some story time. A very great book, a um, <clears throat> fictional book about slave life. Uncle Tom's Cabin. Very important historical American piece of literature that is uh, mysteriously absent from modern day education. This could, this could easily be a valid textbook at any age, in any grade, college level, anything. There's a lot of juicy stuff there. So uh, if you're just joining us, I already talk, did an introduction and um, <clears throat> talked about uh, chapter one, laying down some of the foundation and groundwork uh, for Uncle Tom's Cabin there. But I'm, I'm eventually, I hope to get through the whole book in this year, and we'll hopefully we'll have a lot of fun doing it. <clears throat> um, as you can see, I'm not very 
technologically advanced. This is just bare bones. Oh yeah, don't forget behind me. I put this up, I keep that up there. Um, it's hashtag us to hashtag U-S-T-O-O. -O. Uh, Google that, you can plug it in your Facebook browser and it'll take you to communities that are probably articulating this uh, discussion much better than myself. <clears throat> I'm actually excited today because today I want to switch gears on it. Uh, this is not a linear, like we're not going necessarily historically through the ages, um, through events. Um, some days, I just think recently we talked about immigration and it just happened. I have kind of a list that I'm going by that I created and the day fell after our president talked about immigration and his wall and, and government shutdowns, a lot of things going on. So, the, you know, we're going to be all over the place. So um, maybe if I go in the season two, I'll be more orderly, but I just love being free with this thing. We got 400 plus years of information to cover. And so that's almost one you know, big historical event a day. <laughs> so it's going to be all over the place. We're just going to have fun with it. So today is actually a little more fun. I'm going to switch gears on you. I'm going to play a bit of the devil's advocate. I'm going to advocate for white supremacy, white power, and how it came. I was meditating on this. I work nights <clears throat> at a logistics uh, facility. And um, I was just musing. And I said, you know, it's sad what the white people did, are still doing to black people. It's sad they're still uh, color lines and, and, and black people can't consistently break through these the ceiling. And there, there's some graphs in Dr. Anderson's book where you know, the white people or on top, it looks like a stock market um, display that you can see about a stock that goes up and down, up and down. And you got the whites on the very top, going up and down, up and down. And then the Asians come in a little lower, and it goes up and down. And then the Hispanics to have their space. <laughs> and the poor us, poor black folks, we almost just got a flat line. We just lay in there. We got a little life just to show we're alive as a people, but we are um, underneath all of these other uh, people's groups and uh, communities, you know, part of it is they come to America and um, through their language, cultural ethics, um, through accountability, uh, a national, a sense of national uh, pride, they stay together and those little nuclei of uh, immigrants come and then they broaden and their, their base grows and grows and now they're a community and now they um, have it so that I'm the last person they sit next to on public transportation. <laughs> and that's a true statement, right? You know, uh, like I, there's no, not a whole lot of anger comes from me. Like now that I see the historical roots and stuff about that, it's sad that most, I would say most people um, allow the attitudes and racism to prevail, but it's not, it doesn't come from black folks. I'm the last person they sit next to on the train. I can't help being a big black man. Uh, and I feel like I'm smiling or mild mannered most of the time. I don't know why that is. <laughs> All right, today's subject, uh, me being the devil's advocate. I'm going to help the white man. I'm going to, I'm going to be the white man's support. Um, you've heard of blackface, you know, back then, well, back way back where people, the white people put on blackface and black pigment to uh, be a black character in a um, entertainment production. Well, if, if I had white pigment, they put the white pigment on, I'd have white face to be the devil's advocate. 
to be this, I do want to, to give a historical twist here. <clears throat> and it's, a, it's, some, it's about the, some of the important um, changes that occurred to bring, bring people, black people, into slavery, to have the white people dominate them. And that is, um, and this is before the Declaration of Independence, this is before the Revolutionary War. Something I didn't know, this blew me away, is that uh, more than 100 years before, about 150 years before, the Declaration of Independence, Revolutionary War, all that stuff is was the indoctrination of the slavery, you know. And white white people, um, I'm saying I'm an uh, they're they're a devil's advocate today because white people had just a whole. It was a comedy of you've heard a comedy of errors. Well, they, they had a comedy of. Europeans had a comedy of opportunities that you're never going to see again unless we can make it out to the planets. I don't want to start talking about my astronomy, my amateur astronomy um, desires and stuff, but it, it would be what I'm going to talk about today is the same thing that would happen if the humans, if we get to Mars and get a good colony going out there and making it work, I imagine similar things happening that happened here on Earth. So I say 150 years roughly before uh, the Declaration of Independence, um, where uh, white people were um, supported in that document as having access to wealth and resources of the nation and blacks being excluded in that document. Um, 150 years before that was when some of the formal written uh, uh, indoctrination uh, of this slave ethic began. It began in the Maryland colony at that time. And it was back in 1638. I'm coming out of a Black History Reader, page 78. And you'll see about halfway down the page. In 1638, an edict was established in Maryland. Maryland was, was the crucible, was the, uh, you know, the test area for some of this, uh, for some of the, the, the early kernels of uh, coming in, being white dominant, and, and infringing on black life. And the edict said that um, uh, neither, neither blacks or their offspring would be permitted to enjoy the fruits of white society. That began, that's 150 years before. And American history, right, it's so, it's diabolical, I'll tell you. Like now that it's being untangled in my mind, it's really diabolical. Because they don't talk uh, about how the slaves became slaves. It's almost like uh, that slavery appears just before the Civil War. There's a big fight, emancipation and all this stuff. And it looks like... Um, it's just crazy the way it's presented. It's not properly presented. It's not presented in a way it doesn't have the historical context. You know, it's not slave. It's not slavery as a seed planted in American society that grew and blossomed um, into a mega billion dollar industry worldwide. <laughs> it's just uh, you know the slaves just happened. Um, there in the colonies and there's a civil war. <laughs> oh, that's diabolical. Devil's advocate. Oh, comedy of opportunity. Uh, that's 1638. About 25 years later is when the first law about slavery in Maryland. Remember, Maryland's the crucible. This is where it's 
Maryland is where it's happening. <clears throat> in 1663, the Maryland legislature confirmed the public edict about uh, blacks not permitted to enjoy the fruits of white society, which is which is all the fruit, which is all of the wealth and resources. It says white society, but what it, it means all, all of it. Not it's not like the blacks had something. It means all of it. <laughs> oh, devil's advocate. That all Negroes shall serve as slaves for life. Boom. Now I tell you, I was thinking about that that paragraph that that information appears, and I thought about it as like I'm in a room, uh, me maybe my loved ones with me, and the room's filled with gas. Everybody knows it, and uh, you know some crazy white dude starts pulling out a lighter and starts fooling around. I'm going to slowly back towards the door and look for the exit. You know, it's interesting the when when the 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 law came about in um, 1663, it's like the door shut, but at least the door could be opened before that. Maybe you know, I, I'm guessing like there there was probably some uh, efforts. Um, to, to keep blacks in the dark about what was preparing to happen, you know, because I mean, it was the white people who want to set it off. They're going to put it in writing, and they're going to make it happen. And they obviously had the power to do it at that time. Uh, Sixteen sixty-three. Uh, Negroes shall be slaves for life. And now here's another thing about the law. These laws. Uh, uh, three fifths of a human being, slaves for life. They're never, they're never really repealed. You know, the, the any any type of freedoms or emancipations are more like rewordings. But you, you don't you don't hear a full reversal of that. You know, maybe I'll get more clarity. We'll talk about emancipation and all that uh, eventually. I'm sure. So that's some of the historical context. We can even go back further and, and talk about how the Catholic Church was involved with slavery. But I wanted to start there uh, so that now that we're not along, I want to center around this comedy of opportunities around 1776 and, and the Revolutionary War and getting away from England and things like that because... Um, that having the slaves here in America was the workforce, was the labor, was the machinery that allowed America to have a war. You, know, you can't have your, you can't have much of a successful war if you don't have supply. So their supply was black labor. Okay. It was black labor, unpaid black labor, right? It was a foundation, 150 years worth. You know, they had you know, put it and molded it, and it became an institution and had it ready to go by um, the Revolutionary War. Okay, so that the Maryland, you know, that what happened there in the 1600s, early 1600s, up to 1663, very important in today's discussion. So our comedy opportunity first um, is uh, the geographical opportunity. These may not necessarily be in order because it all these all come together, what I'm going to talk about uh, today. The geographical opportunity. They, you know, had um, these colonies say, been maybe in the uh, northwestern tip of Africa or um, anywhere along the Mediterranean Sea, you know, anywhere in proximity to England, it, they wouldn't have been able to be as successful in get, uh, severing their ties from England 
had there been had they been closer physically uh, to England and the Crown back um, t um, towards uh, 1776, wouldn't have been possible that there would have been you get the armies there faster. Um, the, the England's I don't know who their allies may have been at the time, but the, you know they could. Put pressure on the colony if, if they were closer, but lo and behold, there was a whole Atlantic Ocean to cross, and uh, you know I think you know they got the red coats, and I wouldn't be too ready for war after I'm sitting on a ship for uh, months. I, oh, I forgot to Google how long it's. If you Google how long it takes back in 1776. For a ship to come from England to the Americas up there, and you'll get get in a sense of how a soldier's going to feel, you know, because they ain't doing nothing for those that month or two crossing the Atlantic Ocean, you know, to some mysterious place, you know. So they had, so the colonists had a big geographical opportunity. They had an obvious resource opportunity. Man, their their eyes must have been bulging when they saw all these fields and the wildlife and it was just all this virgin territory and area when they went up to the heights of the Appalachian Mountains and looked out and the land just continued to go and go and go. It was like their eyes must have been like, my goodness, let's we gotta get some. We we want all of that. And then like in the king <laughs> in England you know, the, these monarchs are just so self-centered and ignorant. You know, they think their power is so pervasive and complete that they can tell these people. They got no idea these these people are in the candy store <laughs> on the other side of this ocean. And they have no idea. Uh, you, you, I mean, you know how it is. You know, you, you get comfortable in a space. And it starts working for you. You start putting up decorations and everything, and that, that's that's your space. You own that now. Don't let anybody tell you anything about it. So the resource opportunity, labor opportunity, we talked about that. 1663, Maryland said uh, the Negroes are slaves. All the colonies went along. Remember, all the colonies, all of America, was slave. Was down with slavery. All. This abolition stuff, and I know we'll untangle all that later, but America was a slave-holding country. Military opportunity, obvious, you know, the red coats came. <laughs> and these, like, you know, idiots unable to change. You know, they lined up in their blocks, and they had their drums and fife and flags and, and like, moving around like chess. I like, man, like, man, don't put me in front of this. I mean, they're just marching in a line and blah, 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 blah. it's like, huh. You know, the crazy Americans along probably with, oh, blacks help as well. But uh, there are the Nat um, Native Americans, the Indians helped out as well. You know, they just swarmed around, you know. There's, so we had military opportunity. Okay, and they had privileged opportunity. They said, wow, you know, the, the blacks aren't sneaking out the back door, you know. The, I, I don't know, I, I get a sense of that kind of thing when, when, I'm, when my environment is starting to be threatening and I just feel it in my stomach. I'm getting out of there. I'm, I'm away, <laughs> you know. But uh, this group stuck around, and here, here we are, you know, 400 uh, years later. Um, so, and then they have the, the, I say privilege opportunity because, you know, like I, just like I said, they had, they settled down. They started decorating, building houses. That's my farm. You know, that's my cow, you know. And these guys were claiming thousands of square acres, tens of thousands of square acres of land. 
<laughs> you know, forget about it, you know. Um, and in, in, um, in return to the black service, to the black uh, power, labor, the black labor power that um, girded uh, the nation so that they could have this successful war, so that they could um, you know, kind of give, give a, the Americans salute. I won't do it here. I'll try to keep it even PG-13 child friendly, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the old American salute and, um, you know, told England to step off. It's ours now, you know. You know, it, it didn't, it, we didn't have to have a Boston Tea Party. See, there goes history again. Trust me. Everything could have been nice. A wise man would have been like, man, I'm taking this. You know, you don't have to be a criminal. You don't uh, even or look or appear opportunistic. You just say, man, this, we can't pass this opportunity up. We got to take it all. If we don't take it now, man, you think a year earlier, a year later, you never know. That, that would, it happened at that time. So um, that's when it happened, and that's when they took it. It's amazing. Um, all those um, opportunities happen, happening in that moment. They can't happen anywhere again, anywhere on the earth. Um, we can move too fast and respond too fast. And we, you know, we can check in and stuff. And man, we have airplanes now. We can um, circle the globe and relatively short amounts of times we can move equipment so it'd be very hard uh, for someone to split off from their nation and to raise their own flag you know but the um, well, because they were on old wooden ships and dependent on the wind <laughs> you know they they had it man and I want to be the uh, white man's advocate today and say, you know, um, yeah, I wonder had things been different, you know, well, what would blacks have done if there had been sailing and the technology and those opportunities and things like that, you know? Hard to say. Hard to say. Nobody knows, but, but um, the white man... White men saw this opportunity, and they took it. And that's, you know, there's the, the seeds of slavery, you know. Probably, well, I mean, we can go further back than um, 16, 1638, of course, and, and, and 1663. Uh, uh, those, those were when these, the slavery ideas began to solidify on that foundation uh, rest all of this success and opportunity uh, for the white colonists at the time. Thanks for sticking with me. That was day 11, 365 days to racial change. Let's hope I see you tomorrow. Thanks again.